Welcome to another broadcast of Truth Be Told. I'm your host, Tony Sweet, and joining me in studio is Captain Ron, your co-host. We have a great show for you guys. If you like to travel to the ancient lands of Egypt, we have world-renowned Egyptologist Stephen Mailer on the show. Stephen has been on our show many times, and we have a great time with him every single time, and we hope you learn something today. Stephen's fascination with Egypt began at the age of eight, and it has guided his education and spiritual work all his life. Stephen has written two books, The Land of Osiris and From the Light into Darkness, The Evolution of Religion in Ancient Egypt. Stephen is currently director of research of his own Land of Osiris research project. And Stephen currently does tours to Egypt and other sites. And I think you guys should check that out because one day I am going with him. So to find out what his upcoming tour is all about, what's been going on, any new discoveries, we have with us today Egyptologist Stephen Mailer. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Stephen. Yeah. Back to Truth Be Told. How you doing, sir? Hi, I'm doing fine. How are you? We are great. And again, I, I was we were talking before the show that uh, last year you were our first guest in 2016. So you're now becoming like a tradition of bringing I like up. It. I know the tradition of bringing the New Year's in with you. So, so happy New Year! Happy New Year! Well. Stephen, so much goes on in your life. Uh, <laughs> you get to do the things that we just hope to be able to do, travel the worlds and get to see the ancient sites. Uh, so first of all, tell us what's been going on in, uh, in this last year. Well, last year was actually started out, you know, a lot of people have talked about 2016 being a terrible year uh, for certain reasons what we can discuss. But right, right. For me, it was great. I did two tours to Egypt and a tour again to Peru and Bolivia. So uh, and we got another tour coming up and this is why we're talking. We still have room available on a tour in March. It's March 6th to 19th. And uh, we're also going to be doing an extension to Jordan and, and a great Ooh. site of Petra, which I'd like to discuss. Awesome. That's great. Well, well, listen, Stephen. That would be amazing to see that. And one yes, it, uh, we're finding a lot more information about it. In fact, I just had a good friend who was there. So gave us some on site information. Uh, this is an incredible place. In, uh, Petra was known actually 2,000 years ago as the Las Vegas of the Middle oh, East. So nice. you can imagine all the ramifications we're talking about. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, before we get started with uh, maybe some of the tours, can we talk a little bit about what is going on in Syria? Not necessarily the, the, the war that's going on, but, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, about the destruction of some of the sites that uh, have been destroyed. It's horrific. Can, can yeah. you talk about some of these sites that uh, are being destroyed and just wiped sure. off the map? First of all, we have to discuss the role of the media and what the media portrays in all of this and what's actually been portrayed. Let's do it. Now, I can tell you for a fact, some of the videos I've seen at some of the sites in Iraq that shows supposedly ISIS destroying ancient artifacts are phony. Really? They're actually a plaster copies. It's easy to see when you see them taking the the the, uh, the thick the, the chisels to them, the axes and the hammers, the way they crash, the way they break into pieces, that they're all copies. So whether this is being put out as propaganda, again, you're getting into a whole can of worms when you open this area uh, as far as that goes. Hmm. Whether there actually has been destruction of sites, we don't know. I'd wow. have to go to That'd Iraq myself. You know, and our group would have to go because Iraq, Syria, Jordan, all of these areas have all part of what the civilization, what we're going to talk about tonight. We talk about ancient civilization, which we call Kemet or Kemt, right. which people think is ancient Egypt, but it was not just Egypt. It would have covered Israel, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Iran, and Turkey, and parts of the Middle East. So all of that area was part of the ancient civilization that we study, and we look for the great artifacts in the ancient parts. And so yeah, if they actually have been destroyed, it would be a terrible loss. But what I saw, to be honest, on these videos, they were all copies and they were all plaster, not stone. We hope, we hope so. We, we hope, hope that's true. Yeah. Yeah. When I saw, we know, we know things have gone on in Iraq. You know, we, we we can't be sure until you get our international archaeological teams in there to see what has actually been damaged, what has not been damaged. But 
if you want the truth about it, when we first went into Iraq, those that were selling antiquities who broke into museums yeah, in Iraq that. were American Marines. I remember so that. So let's tell the truth. <laughs> you t you tell them, Stephen. <laughs> well, it, so, it, I'm a, I'm a big. If you enter the, the world market, international market in antiquities, mm -hmm. has been going on for thousands of years, and it's all cultures, all people, all groups that steal from the ancient civilizations and sell it. And you know, the greatest collection of ancient antiquities are in private hands, not in museums. Really, that's interesting. Well, certainly, we're out of fact. I mean, again, you just want to talk about the opening of Tut. Tut's tomb, 1922, it was officially announced like November 20th. They had the official opening. But the fact is that Carter and Carnarvon broke into the tomb three weeks earlier. There's a book about this written by Thomas Hoving, who was the curator of the uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York, right. about Tut, Tut, the true history of Tutankhamen's the tomb finding, that they stole things. And there are things today, if you guys are fans of uh, Downton Abbey, Right. Well, I never seen it, but everybody else seems to be. <laughs> okay, well, that takes place at High Clear Castle, which is the Carnarvon Castle, and in High Clear, the actual place where Down Abbey was filmed, there are secret chambers in that in that chateau in the castle that have antiquities stolen from Tut's tomb that were given wow. to Carnarvon by Carter before the tomb was ever opened. Wow. So the fact of the matter is, is that this has been going on. So who's got what and who's got where? You know, the greatest thief. <laughs> of Egyptian antiquities in the last 50 years was the man who was head of the Department of Antiquities, Zahi Huaz. Yes, that I've heard, too. Yeah, George oh, there's said no that, doubt yeah. about it. Yeah, And I, it makes sense, though. You think these people, why would they destroy it when they can make money off of it? And they say he's gone into places like maybe under the Sphinx and whatnot and never revealed that they've gone there. They right. won't let money go, but they say they've already gone. Possibly. There's certain a lot of things that I've never... People come on to read things that people get to see. Other... See, we show you, reveal was the ancient civilization and how the other civilizations came in and added to it, on to it. We look for things in that tone that was used, the technology we can see that has great difficulty being explained for what the tools of to the ancient people. Well, we're, we're cutting out just a little bit, but I, I think we, we got the gist of what you were saying. Um, well, can you hear us okay, Stephen? I just want to make sure. I hear you. Yeah, you're bringing in and out. Some reason we're not having a connection right now. Yeah, it's funny we were having great connection. Maybe it's the maybe it's the powers that be. They don't want us to talk about the. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've had uh, I've had bad connections here in Colorado the last day or two. We just had a big storm. Oh, really? We had uh, ten inches of snow, a couple of feet of snow in the mountains, and it seems to have affected internet connections. All right. So, okay, when you put your tours together, what what is how do you plan your tours? Uh, is it is it for uh, just for uh, you know, showing people the ancient sites, or do you guys get to go explore, do archaeology also? Beautiful. Or yes, all of the above. We call it techno spiritual. So we cover. It is how uh, the, the teacher, the man who taught me really all I know and what we based this whole teaching on, whose name was Abdel Hakim Mawian. I've spoken about him. He was a tour guide, an Egyptologist for 56 years. He was a field archaeologist for 75 years, worked as a small boy at six years old, working for American archaeologists and Egyptologists. So his teaching was that there's a previously high advanced civilization mm -hmm. that existed in prehistory. We say before 10,000 years ago. And they had the ability to carve the Sphinx, build the pyramids, which were not tombs for anyone. Right. So what we do is we, we devise a program where we get people to see the physical evidence that we can show, the techno, the fact of the incredible work in the hardest stone, the hardest material that have ever been on this planet. And then we do a spiritual thing because that's how Hakim taught, because there was no separation to the ancient people, techno, spiritual. The, uh, the material and the spiritual were all the same to them. They didn't separate it. So we can meditate at the sites. We'd have spiritual experiences at the sites. And we can investigate. As you said, we can take people to areas and, and areas where archaeology is going on, where things are going on, and they can see things that are happening at the motion. But we, we cover the whole spectrum in our tours of doing it, uh, uh, teaching as, as my teacher Hakim did from both sides of the brain, giving you the, the physical evidence, stimulating the left brain, but also the right brain to have the experience hmm. and the direct knowing. Hey, Stephen, you know, you just mentioned that there about the um, the pyramids being a tomb. Does it frustrate you as it frustrates me? I mean, I have felt for a long time after listening to people like yourself that clearly these were not tombs. That seems so asinine to me at this point. 
I, I well, completely. Abner, it's Abner not. was doing this fifty years, so you're talking about fifty years. Of <laughs> right now, but 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 when you talk to like the average person on the street, they'll I'll, I'll hear someone say to me, "Well, yeah, that was a tomb." And I think unless they watch Ancient Aliens or something right. else or listen to these radio programs, so, right. does that then frustrate you? How do you how do you handle that? I mean, if they're they oh, seem it's, so ignorant, it's been an ongoing. I mean, we not only. You see, I'm in between the field because I'm not in the ancient aliens group. So I'm actually uh, attacked by academia, of course. Ac Egyptology doesn't want to recognize anything we do. But I'm also attacked by attacked by so-called alternative field, too, the UFO family, because we, we don't support that idea, although we can discuss that. Because in my first book, I discussed this subject in quite detail, because we follow the indigenous oral tradition. And the indigenous tradition of indigenous people throughout the world is that we are star seeds, that we are visitors to this planet. Yes, we have come from other star systems, but many different places. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are adamant in saying that aliens didn't build the Great Pyramid, didn't carve the Sphinx. That's insult to our ancestors, because we talk about cycles, that we've moved through different cycles. So you want to know, I mean, I actively got into this field in the 80s, start, wrote my first, started doing lectures and tours, went to Egypt first in 1992. So this is 40 years, 30 years you're talking about, 20 years, 30 years of this frustration of having to deal with that, of having to look every time National Geographic has Zahi Hawass on, I have to turn the channel off. Every right. time History <laughs> Channel has something standard about. But the fact of the matter is because of people like you guys. And because of us, of course, Brian Foster's, the Chris Dunn's, the Robert Shocks, the people who've done the alternative work in the field, uh, uh, more and more, especially if you look at young people. Now, you talk about the average person in the street. Yes, maybe someone over the age of 50 would say, oh, yeah, it was a tomb for a king. But if you look at the average person under the age of 40 now, 30, they will say, no, aliens built it. Or, no, it was some kind of super technology because they've been looking at different things. Right. They've been exposed to different things. So we have made inroads. I mean, it, it is what my teacher called, that we're going to what's called the awakening, that we're going to come out of this time of darkness, which is 5,000 plus years, which we can discuss in detail if you'd like. 5,000 years of darkness we're about to come out of now. And we have the, now the darkest moment maybe in American history right. to come out. Well, hey, while and you're talking funny. about that, about the age, that's another thing that I get frustrated with. I always hear the pyramids are like four to 5,000 years old. And again, listening to people like yourself and other people here on coast and whatnot, it seems much, much older. At least ten or 13,000 seems to be the predominant. About this. I've heard as long as 800. There's a field now that's very popular called archaeoastronomy, where a lot of people are trying to show that the ancient sites were connected to star systems in different constellations. We don't support that. Because we're talking about a time prior to 10,000 years ago. Mm. We see that there was a major worldwide cataclysm. Many people have different ideas, theories, what was the cause of the cataclysm. But there's a consensus among a lot of alternative researchers like Robert Schock, like uh, 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 Graham Hancock. That, mm -hmm. And Brian Forster wrote a beautiful book on the subject. I talk about it in my second book, that there was a worldwide cataclysm around 12,000 years ago. And the sky changed. The earth shifted on its axis to its current pole, 23 and a half degree tilt, where we have the precession of the equinoxes. So we don't see that their archaeology, the astronomy of the sky was the same. So we don't support that. But there are people who are at least finding that there's different ways to look at these pyramids. But when I would talk with my wonderful master, Hakim, and I would ask him, how do we date the pyramids? He would say, well, in his tradition that was taught to him and which he came to realize himself, when the Great Pyramid was aligned, there was no star, no Orion, no other star system which people like to tune it to. But he said it was tuned, it was aligned to the pole star. Hmm. What was the pole star at that time? And he said it was Polaris. Polaris is about to become our pole star again. So if we go back a processional age, 26,000 years, that's wow. when the Great Pyramid. So you don't agree with Robert Preval on that. Not at all. Not hmm. at all. Hmm. Interesting. Not at all. Can, now, we can, totally disagree with Boval and all of those theories. Well, I'm sh now you got my my intrigue. Berkeley. Yeah, go on here about the the dark the five thousand years of darkness. Yes. Let's talk about the age of Amun. Let's we, talk we about talk that. About, we talk about five stages of the sun. The sun going through five daily cycles, which goes from Cheper, which is dawn, Ra, which is the, the sun at noon, Un, which is the sun middle of the sky. Aten, which is the sun as it's about to come down, twilight, and Amun, which is darkness. 
So we talk about these things not only as daily cycles of the sun, but ages of humanity, cycles we've gone through. So we talk about like the Kali, the Yugas in the Vedic tradition, they talk about four. We talk about five. I brought with me a great scholar named Satyan Raja, who te- who's a Canadian, uh, another person you should interview, does leadership training te- and wonderful seminars in Canada, has come to Egypt with me twice. So he sat with Hakim and he asked me, he says, you know, in, in the Vedic tradition, we talk about four. You talk about five. So Hakim would say, ah, you say four, we say five. It's the same thing. <laughs> cycles. So then when I would lecture with people, I would say, okay, folks, what cycle do you think we're in now? And most people would think, oh, well, we're in the highest stage. And this was maybe more than 30 years ago. Now people have really caught up to it. But they would originally say, oh, aren't we the highest phase of humanity, the highest thing that's ever been on this planet? No, thanks for <laughs> that's playing. The humans feel we that are way, in we're, Amun. Always... we're in the darkness. We are in the darkness. What is it characterized by polarity consciousness? Male, female, gay, straight, black, white. Hispanic, blah, blah, right. blah, 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 labels, labels, like <laughs> the separation, polarity, and it's characterized by the rise of patriarchal religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Concomitant to those rise is systematic warfare. Now, again, I get this all the time. I am a student of prehistory. I have been studying human prehistory for 50 years. People will come to me and say, well, haven't humans always had wars? Well, there's always been conflict. There's always been skirmishes. But when we say systemic warfare, you mean city-states, you mean organized armies, did not exist prior to 5,000 years ago. Hmm. Hmm. Why, uh, we're like speeches now. Yeah, because you, you don't <laughs> think of it that way. You don't think of that. That's uh-uh. true. There were no city-states, of course. Of course it not. Was... The Greeks started it. Right. The Greeks and then and Judaism starts the separation and the, and, the, and the conflict is us and them. We are the chosen people. So that means the other people are not chosen. <laughs> and so then Christianity comes along and says, oh, no, the Jews got it wrong. We we got this guy here. God decided to have a son, and as Lewis Black said, maybe God went through anger management training because the New Testament he's sweet and good and all forgiving. The Old Testament he's out of control. So so God probably went through some management training, and Christianity comes. No, the Muslims come along and say, wait a minute, the Christians didn't get it right either. We got it right. But it's all the same thing. They all right. say that the people of the book, it's the same story. When I give my lecture, I say it all came from Egyptian religion, the religion of Amun becomes Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah, uh, go on and on and on. Right, same. And so uh, the, the, the different civilizations that you have um, studied, uh, what are the similarities that you can see not only in their structure, in their uh, hieroglyphs, but also in their culture? What, what are s- the similarities? Great point. an understanding I came to even before I met Hakim because I have two master's degrees. My second master's degree is technically in Egyptology, but it was through the women's studies department at Santa Fe State University Mm. in the 70s. I was a raging feminist. And what I discovered was long before I met Hakim that ancient Egypt was a matriarchy, Mm. that descent went from mother to daughter. And Hakim only highly emphasized that because he talked very deeply about it. So wait a minute, we're saying. People say, wait a minute, who are these guys on the thrones? What does this mean, Pharaoh? Well, that's one of our teachings. Everybody, including myself, has used that word wrong. Pharaoh, based on a Greek word, phario, based on a Hebrew term, pedo. It meant, in its original term, the high house. It's based on a Mm. commission expression, per ah. Ah, becomes to the Greeks Pharaoh. It meant the high house. It was the woman's house. Uh-huh. Made descent in ancient Egypt up until Cleopatra, up until the end, up until the Greeks came in and brought patriarchy, up until the Romans came in and brought patriarchy. Ancient Egypt was matriarchal. It was not just equal women and men. Women were considered superior, superior spiritually, and descent went from mother to daughter. So. Everyone who's used the term pharaoh as a male king is wrong. There no were no male pharaohs. Period. End of discussion. Well, I now, there's no even a question pharaohs? as whether they were kings. It, it, Hakim would even argue in the early days, huh. so-called old kingdom period, which is around the time the Great Pyramid was supposed to be That's built right. as a tomb for a king, it can be argued that they were not kings. That what's being shown is what you have is not a monarchy, but a theocracy. A priesthood, priestesshood that ran the civilization. And they conspired. I call this the great unholy alliance. Because think about what I'm going to say now and through all the history that you've studied in the last 5,000 years. 
In Egypt, in ancient Kemet, there came a time where the ruling military classes, the ruling classes, the power classes, made an arrangement with the budding priesthood. Religion was just beginning. They were becoming powerful, and they decided to form the alliance that exists today between governments and religion, and they controlled the civilization. But it was a theocracy. The priests decided which one would be the ruling family. And the faces that you see on the glyphs, the statues, the temples, all on the walls are just the male head of the family who's being flattered by the priest. <laughs> I have an elaborate tomb. Again, I, I mean, I'm doing my whole second book for you here in a short 30-minute synopsis, but it really <laughs> is. What is religion? Religion was the business based on spiritual spirituality. What did it start with? The fear of death. Again, we talk about Hakim, one of his major teachings right at the beginning is there was no word for death in the ancient Commission language. No word for death. It was said that you west or wested. In other words, they did not see it as a change. They saw life as a continual process. Death was only to them, to just dropping the body was just changing form. They had no word for death. Death comes in when we go through this cataclysm and people start to wane in their senses. We come from this, the period that I'm talking about before now, Aten. The age of Aten was the age of total enlightenment. Mm -hmm. About 20,000 years ago, we were all in the state of consciousness. We were all high degree. There was no religion. There was no God. It was all just spirituality. Everything in life was spiritual. Everything material was spiritual. No separation. It then is when the cataclysm comes shakes up everybody from this reverie. And this is the mythology of all peoples in the world. Again, there's a flood myth in 250 different peoples around the world. The myth of a, of a worldwide flood, something happens. Every culture that has come down through mythology to us today in the modern world, through now patriarchal culture, talks about a great cataclysm. Mm -hmm. The mud, Noah, the flood, whatever. Whatever, whatever. We know now something did exist. We can even show. Brian Foster has a wonderful book called Aftershock, where he shows you the physical evidence that we show at the sites of the cataclysm. Pumba Pumku Tijuanaco in, in Bolivia is the greatest site to show cataclysmic evidence. But we show it everywhere. We have sites in Egypt. We can show you hundred ton blocks of granite knocked on its side like it was a pebble. What could do that? A 10 plus earthquake has to be. A tsunami of 200 feet has to be. You see silt at Pumtiyuhunako, six feet of silt. There was a huge flood, a huge tsunami caused these things. We see the evidence, it's quite obvious. Again, we can differ what's the cause. We, I say it was a, a comet, a, a, a supernova, excuse me, so called the Vela supernova. People can Google it, V-E-L-A, occurred between 14,000 to 10,000 years ago. The evident uh, astronomers can still find background radiation, background effects of this supernova today. So it ended the civilization. So people started to lose their consciousness. They were, they were not in the highest state anymore. So there were certain individuals who kept themselves in the state of consciousness. Did they use psychoactive plants? Yes. Did they use other types of techniques? Yes. They kept themselves in a high state of consciousness. And they're the ones that went to these people and said, what do you think happens to this when we drop it? People didn't care. I don't leave it out for the birds, the buzzards. <laughs> Tibetans do that today. The Tibetans do that today. When somebody dies, they break the bones of the body, they put it on the platform for the vultures. Because the body is transitive. It's not important. It's, you know, in, in, in India, we burn the body. In, in Egypt, they mummified. That's how they made it different. So here's how religion begins. They began it with the fear of death. What happens to this? You don't know. We'll take care of it. We'll do prayers for it. We'll mummify it so you can come back to it. And we'll do all of these special rituals and techniques. Okay, but you, what you have to do is give a quarter of your harvest every year to the temple, which we're creating. You have to give certain distance. We're not going to work. You have to support us. You have to take care of us with what you all the rest of you do, and we'll take care of the afterlife for everybody. That is how religion began, hmm. very, very simply, around five to eight thousand years ago, not before. And I get into arguments, you talk about arguments all the time on Facebook. No, 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 Neanderthal had religion. We can see it didn't every culture. No, <laughs> this is what they taught in academia. We're hardwired for religion. We are not. We're hardwired to have some type of spiritual experience, to look at the sky and look at the stars and say, wait a minute, there's something more than us here. There's something else more happening. That is, you can go back to the dim mists of prehistory The humans did that. It's so far back, we couldn't even put a date on it. When people looked up and realized there's more than just this. Right. Okay, yeah. but religion? No. God? No. Can't find any evidence of God before 10,000 years ago.
Here's a question for you, Stephen. You were just talking. Is that, Go ahead. There, you, you were saying that you have all this evidence for the cataclysmic uh, from from the silt and whatnot. What about you were talking about ancient technologies? What what evidence do you have that there was? What's the strongest piece of evidence I could show somebody to show that there was great advanced technology in the past? Again, you just you, we discussed it before we came on the air. Go on to YouTube and look at Brian Foster Ancient uh, Inca Videos dot. Uh, uh, hiddenincavideos.com look at Brian Foster's videos of Egypt and what he's done in, then but there's also the great person that I bring into here is Christopher Dunn uh, a master machinist who was, who was recruited by the US aerospace industry at 19 years old as a master journeyman machinist from Britain immigrated to the, immigrated to the United States lived in Indiana, lives in Illinois today uh, went to Egypt in 1985 he thinks the Great Pyramid there. was a machine he back engineered the Great Pyramid. Yeah. So two books, The Giza Power Plant and Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. Two books Christopher has written, highly technical, but explains it as well as possible from the eyes of a master machinist looking at what he saw, said that there had to be a technology here, had to be machining. We cannot there again, we're we're at one school here, there are many others. We can talk about, we don't have time in an hour to discuss all the different alternative theories. There are those that say that the stones were melted and they were fused and they were made like concrete. We refute that completely because we've tested the stone. But, you know, the theory we follow is lost ancient advanced machining, basically per, per, uh, brought to us by Christopher Dunn in his book, landmark book, The Giza Power Plant, came out in 1998. Hmm. And his second book came out in 2010. And he's been back and he's writing a third book. Uh, you see drill marks, we see perfect square angles, you see the hardest stone on the planet. We're looking at things like not just limestone, which is really easy to carve, sandstone even easier. No, we're talking about basalt, hmm. the diorite, the granodiorite, the granite. Now we've even gone further. For the longest time, granite was our standard. Granite's like the hard stone, seven on the Mohs scale. If people want to know MOHS, it's the scale that geology and mineralogy uses to rate the hardness of stone. Diamond, of course, being 10. So quartz is seven. So granite gets a rating of seven because of the quartz content that's in it. And we have found some of the ancient stone that, that was used. They picked it particularly for its quartz content, for its ability to vibrate. We have now come up with, with a very technical term, which I'm going to lay out to your audience if they're interested that we think was the favorite stone of the ancient people of this time period, and it's technically called porphyritic granodiorite. It's, it's a, a transitional stone, it's almost pure granite, has granite in it, it's diorite, which is next to granite, but it's full of quartz. And what we have found, it's the most resonant of stone. Now again, Hakim taught us and handed down to us, how was this all done? He told me, knowing me as an archeologist, I had already had the degrees, the background experience when I met him in archeology, span physics, geology, chemistry. He told me to concentrate my research on sound and water. Hmm. The knowledge that the ancients had and the interplay of both. And what we tell us, what we're gonna say to you is, they used sound to create anti-gravity fields, to lift this megatonnage. They used sound to alter the physics of stone, to make it easier to cut, to shape. To, and they use sound for healing. They use sound for so many different things, we don't have enough time to discuss it. Hakim <laughs> gave us a little teaching. He said, think about it, just in the English language. And this was a man that spoke seven languages fluently uh, uh, and the ancient Commission language, which very few people could. Uh, he could fake it in Japanese and Chinese. I saw him do it. And, uh, and he could think in English. Now think about that. For someone who's not a native-born speaker, okay, we, you know, we, we, we speak another language, we usually think about it in English first, and then we translate it in our mind into that other language. Like, if I'm going to talk to you in French, I'm going to think of the English word first, then the French word, and, and speak to you. Well, he could think in English without even having to go through Arabic. And what he would say to us, think in the English language itself, how many words are used to describe sound? Loud, noisy, I love it, harmonious, every. But then I, would, I said, I stopped and said, practically every adjective and adverb mm -hmm. in the English language is used for sound. Every one. So think about it. Then he would say, think about the ancient languages, languages that are much older than English. Think about how many different words there were for sound in those ancient languages. So he said, think that shows you how ancient an understanding it is. Sound is very key and water. So how was it all done? Through the use of sound, 
solar power, the sun, and running water, creating electromagnetic fields wow. using what Chris Dunn now gives us the term that we use, ultrasonic impact machining, meaning a tool where the tip is vibrating at an incredible frequency, maybe thousands of RPMs per second. It produces a sonic field in front of it. That sound alters the physics of stone. We have proof of this. Again, I say we show it. I'm not just talking out of my mouth. You guys come with me to Egypt. Everybody's listening, come to Egypt. As soon as we go into the Egyptian museum, there is now an artifact there that proves this theory totally. There is a box that's off to the side out of rose granite where the lid is still attached, which shows that they cut the lids for these boxes out of the same mother piece as the mother box. But whoever was using the tool slipped and it went off into a direction. And you can see that there was a line that had been etched in the stone, not where I thought originally by black ochre paint. No, physics altered the stone. And they actually drew an outline that they were going to follow. But the person lost control of the stool, the tool, and it went off. Huh. And show that to everybody, how they could drill through rose granite like it was butter. Hmm. Wow. Well, you got me again. You're you're doing the the damn good job that you always do so what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break for our sponsor and uh, when we come back we have more to ask with our uh world-renowned egyptologist stephen mailer uh so don't go anywhere this is truth be told i'm tony sweet captain ron we'll be right back you suffer from anxiety from depression maybe even chronic pain well listen up truth be told is going to tell you about a breakthrough program built on over a hundred years of therapies used in america's returning veterans to help you successfully overcome PTSD, anxiety attacks, pain, and depression. The secret proven in study after study. Music therapy. The effects of music are nothing short of amazing. From strokes to PTSD, music has been shown to improve the quality of life. Now one of the latest music therapy programs being used in America's veteran hospitals can be yours to experience for free at home and to help your own anxiety attacks, pain, and depression. Or just relax after a hard day. It's called Whole Tones. It takes music therapy to a new level. This revolutionary program makes use of specifically designed frequencies that have been shown to stimulate your body's natural healing power down to a cellular level. If it works for battle-scarred vets, can it work for you? Well, experience it for yourself for free at SweetWholeTones.com. Like Tony Sweet, that's S-W-E-E-T. Go to SweetWholeTones.com. Now enjoy the show. Do you suffer from anxiety, from depression, maybe even chronic pain? Well, listen up. United States Pharmacopeia, USP, sets the standard for most food supplements and are used in over 95% of all vitamin and mineral supplements in the world. The problem is that these products have never appeared in any living tissue. They're created in laboratories and are not recognizable to the body's metabolism. Grown by nature products are different because they use renatured ingredients, proprietary blends of essential vitamins and minerals with cofactors of proteins, lipids, and complex carbohydrates. Over 50 studies have been conducted on renatured nutrients, and over 20 have been published in peer-reviewed journals proclaiming their superiority. As a result, grown by nature vitamins and supplements are now recognized as simply the best available. Call 877-817-9829. That's 877-817-9829 and order your grown by nature products today. We are what we eat, and since we are of nature, we should eat foods in their natural form. Only Grown by Nature offers a full line of renatured nutrients. Call 877-817-9829. That's 877-817-9829 because not all products are grown by nature, but they should be. All right, we're back. This is Truth Be Told. We have Stephen Mailer. He is a world-famous Egyptologist, if even if it's just with us, but no, people know him from all over <laughs> the world. Right? <laughs> but pe people in the chat room, people all over are saying how fascinating you are. They're learning so much as we are every single time. Uh, one thing I want to go back a little bit because uh, you were talking about the, the feminine, the, the matriarch of. But I, what I noticed, I've noticed even as a kid, I remember seeing King Tut's tomb when I was went to when it came through America and back in the I think seventies, maybe seventy seven was in the yes, yeah. uh, but I, I, we saw it in Chicago, yeah. and I I even noticed it. I was like, it, he looked so feminine. Right. He looked. I I thought he was a woman, but so can you talk about that? Did they actually <laughs> try to make them look more feminine, or did he actually was he a woman? <laughs> no, no you're, you're, that's a very good point. No, because they venerated the feminine. So to for a man to be given shown so-called feminine qualities was not 
the opposite of what it would be today, you understand, right. in this heterosexual culture. <laughs> that was a pansexual culture. There was no heterosexuality. There was no homosexuality. So that it would have been an, a quality of, of, of greatness to be given. In other words, they, they all would use this wig that they called it, they called it the Nimi's headdress, Nimisa. Well, Hakim defined it as sweet touch of the feminine, so that men would wear wigs to look feminine, hmm. to look feminine because it made them more important. Not again, and again, people don't understand what a matriarchy is. They think it meant, oh, no, women were on top and men were subjugated like it is today. Right, no, right. not at all. Men knew their place. They knew who they were. There was no definite, there, again, there were no roles. There were no gender roles. There was no occupation that a man had that a woman didn't have. But there were occupations that women had that men didn't have. So, but there was no restrictions. There was an upwardly mobile society of so-called lower class could rise to be upper class. I mean, it was that way. And the feminine was highly. And again, to show you how we go from that, we go from the oldest to the old. We're talking about the pyramids. Let's talk about the Sphinx that because we do the Sphinx totally different than anybody. The ones that would lean on the greatest now that for people should read is Dr. Robert Schock, who who brought, was brought over to Egypt in the 90s, and, and I met John Anthony West there then. John Anthony West brought Robert Schock up to look to look to Egypt to look at the Sphinx and and, and attest to it geolo geologically. And what he found geolo geologically is it's much older. The erosion is much much older. So Hakim used to say, he would stand right in front of the Sphinx and say to people, to all those tour groups, the Sphinx is 54,000 years old. And let somebody prove me wrong. Wow. So what we've done with wow. geology is we've shown that because of the work of Robert Schock, and again, there's Brian Foster videos that show me at the Sphinx talking about this. There are other videos on my Facebook page of me at the Sphinx discussing just what I'm discussing with you now, showing the different layers of limestone that's on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure. Limestone is a sedimentary rock. It forms in sediments under the ocean, hmm. but it is not uniform. In other words, you may have a very hard layer. Then a soft layer, then a harder layer, softer layer, harder, softer, harder. It's not uniform. It's not homogeneous. It is heterogeneous. What Robert Schock painstakingly did is he he, made, he mapped the whole side wall of the Sphinx enclosure and showed that some of the most eroded limestone is the hardest. So he concluded the only thing that could cause that would be rainfall beating down at an angle for not just hundreds, but perhaps thousands of years. So we have now what we call... A, 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 a paleoclimatology, where we can look at ancient climatology patterns, and we see that there was an event that happened all throughout North Africa 30,000 years ago. People can Google it. It's in my book, known as the Mousterian subpluvial, where the type of rainfall that could have caused the erosion on the Sphinx happened. Mm -hmm. Not after. There's been not an event since. There was not a major event before. So that we can say as a geological marker, the Sphinx is at least 30,000 years old. And Hakim said 54,000. And how he calculated that? Very simply. Where he lives, where's the house where we take people to? It's the house of, I actually work, do these tours with Hakim's second youngest son, Yusuf, who's the one who has taken up his father's mantle. We take people to the house. They can see where he grew up, which faces the Giza Plateau, mm -hmm. just down the street. Hakim grew, woke up every morning. As he woke up out of bed, he would face the Sphinx. He would get up before dawn when he was young, go to the Sphinx and watch the sun come up. And what he noticed, what tradition was said is that when the Sphinx, she was carved in the book, get to she, when she was carved, she faced the rising sun and the rising of the star system Sirius. Well, he would notice that as from a young boy, he's born in 1926, that the, the sun is not rising, coming up directly through the middle of the, the eyes of the Sphinx. It's coming off, as he said, two cycles off, or 20 degrees, or two o'clock, if we used it by a clock. So he calculated that was two processional ages. 26,000 times two, 52,000, 54,000, he would say she is. Because when she originally was carved, the, Sphinx would, the sun came up right in the middle of her eyes. Hmm. And we say she because this was a matriarchal society. Mm -hmm. What's come down to us is not a man, a male pharaoh making offering to the sun. That is nonsense. Not even the face today is male, even though it's been recarved. And we'll give you the history. He said when it was original, in their tradition, Again, matriarchal tradition. They are not saying masculine and feminine were equal. They saw the universe and creation being more feminine than masculine. 
It is the feminine which causes the masculine into being. So they saw everything that's uncreated and created. They gave a term newt, N-U-T. The U in ancient languages is always ooh. Newt, she controls all that's created and all that is uncreated. So the tradition states, when Newt wanted to manifest in physical form on the earth, she spit. And where she spit is the Sphinx today. And so she's called in the ancient tradition, Tefnut, the moisture, the saliva of Newt. Now, why you would say spit? I always ask them that. I use the scientific term, when we expectorate, <laughs> it's never the same. And it can't be measured. There's no mass, no volume to our saliva. So he was saying, the ancients were saying, you cannot define the great mother. You cannot. But if you must, here she is. We'll spit. And here's the physical. So the first thing created above ground in this ancient civilization 54,000 years ago was what we call today the Sphinx or Tefnut. But before that, he said, it was, it was, what, is, what, was what is called in geology a limestone outcropping called a yardang. Just what is the, what would have been the level of the plateau would have been to her neck. Just what is today the head would have been above the sand and it would have been just a, a, an un unformed massive limestone which they call the yardang they've been carved that to a face they then carved the front of the sphinx thousands of years later they carved the back of the sphinx dr robert shock proved that the erosion in the front of the sphinx is twice as old as the erosion in the back of the sphinx so when they carved it they just carved the head and the fourth first thousands of years later they carved out the rest of the body and wow. so that's why we date it as we do and as hakim would say somebody proved me wrong well, I, I have a – this is what popped into my head when you're talking about the, the difference between when the pyramids were made and then the Sphinx was made is quite a bit of difference. That's right. I, I'm thinking about when America started, so we're, we're 200 and some years old, uh, how the culture has changed dramatically. It's not even the same. How does one keep – I mean, keep somewhat similarities in their culture – for that many of tens of thousands of years. It was important to them. Well, again, the ancient civilization we're talking about, pre-cataclysmic was not the same. When you're talking about what you're seeing on the walls, the hieroglyphs, the right. stuff, that, that's the so-called dynastic period. They had a tradition of keeping it uniform. Oh, okay. In other words, they were okay. the most conservative of cultures. They waste not, want not. Anything, when you would build a temple, you would take a seed stone. The Masons do this today. This is where Masonic tradition, Rosicrucian tradition comes from. They would take a cornerstone of an old temple as a seed. They saw it as an organic being living and put it in the base of a new temple. So it would sprout and grow like it was a flower. So they kept a uniformity through their tradition with the glyphs, with the signs, it changed. I mean, we talk about this in more detail. Things did change according to the cycles. We go into more detail when we do our lectures on tour and talk mm -hmm. about this in greater detail. But basically, there was a uniformity because that it's built into the culture. Nothing is wasted. Tradition gets built on top of each other, on top of each other, and it carries on for it. This is why uh, the Egyptologists are confused as the way they are, because they can't understand that. They mm -hmm. can't see the layers, how the whole culture was layered upon. And my teacher, again, Hakim, was a master. Peeling away the layers. Hey, so, uh, what did Akim say the the pyramids were? He said fifty four thousand for the Sphinx. The term is called per netter. Netter is incorrectly called God. So they think it was a temple. No, they think it was a tomb. Never. What what is called per per ka? The ka is this physical projection of the body. It's the personality. They gave offerings to the ka. It became the tomb. Per ka tomb. Per ba temple. Per netter pyramid is the house of nature. House of energy. They are machines, just like Chris Dunn said. They are acoustical hmm. machines producing so many different types of energy we could not possibly document it in our lifetimes. But electricity, high, electromagnetism, radio waves, quantum waves, uh, uh, microwaves, hydrogen gas, which is what Chris brought, Dunn brought to this public. Everything about the Great Pyramid is oriented to hydrogen. It's Someone once said, if you wanted to make a radio, that you really want to connect it to extraterrestrials or interdimensional beings, what frequency would you tune it to? Hydrogen. It's the most abundant element in the universe. The Great Pyramid is tuned to the frequency of hydrogen. Yeah, but what age, though? What, what's, what's the time period? He said 54,000 for the Sphinx. Oh, no. The Great Pyramid was fully functional 15, 20,000 years ago. I said it was aligned 26,000 years ago. I so see. by 25, 20,000 years ago, 
the Great Pyramid was a fully functioning machine, but it's not alone. Again, my first book is called Land of Osiris. Hakim took the great, this, the major civilization is called Kemet, but in between Kemet was was the oldest of the old. It's the area we call Boo Wizard in the ancient civilization, Land of Osiris. It is from Dashur in the south, to Abu Dwash in the north, it includes Giza, Saqqara, all the, they all were stone pyramids, all temples, all in a line. You're talking about an ancient energy grid line. Each pyramid tuned to a different frequency of sound. Each temple tuned to a different frequency of sound, acting like musical instruments, hmm. producing infrasound. This was a civilization that for thousands upon thousands of years was bathed in infrasound. What did that sound do? It kept the immune systems at the highest level of functioning so that you could look at the Old Testament, look at the patriarchs from Methuselah to Enoch, they're talking about the ancient commissions who could live hundreds of years. This is fact. Wow. Well, because the time's running out, we need to talk about the tour. I want to find yes. out what, when is it? What's what's they, the schedule? It's March sixth to nineteenth. And please, this is what one of the things I really wanted to come on. We're fighting the media, as I said. Mm -hmm. There is so much nonsense about Egypt not being safe. There's a warning. I want to give people some incentives. First of all, I've been going to Egypt, as you know. This next time will be my twenty-first time wow. in twenty-four years. Never, this will be my at least eighteenth tour group. Never has anybody in my tour group, myself, been in danger or felt any threat. We have on our website testimonials from people who've been coming year after year. Look at my Facebook page. People are coming. It is safe. It is safe. It is safe. But I'll give you another incentive. What the Egyptian government has done just in the last few years is floated their money. They have floated the Egyptian pound because they're trying to get billion dollar loans from the international market. So last year at this time when I went, the Egyptian pound was 7.8 to the dollar. Hmm. As we speak today, it is 18.5. It went wow. up to 19, almost to 20. It will probably settle at 18. So we tell people you can get more bang for your buck ever before. You want to buy carpets, you want to buy papyrus, <laughs> you want to buy statues. This is the time to come because they will bargain. Their prices have doubled and tripled to try to keep up with the floating of the money, but they will bargain. They are a bargaining culture. This is the best time to go to Egypt to get things, rugs, mm. carpets, papyrus, galabayas, whatever you want. It's the best because their money is, is 18.5 now, pounds to the dollar. I listen. If I could, I, if I could go this year, I'm going. But uh, <laughs> uh, well, tell us. Uh, I know Brian Forrester, you, yourself. Who else is going to be on the tour with you? We also have our, our staff geologist Susan Moore, who's taught us more about stone than anybody. That's how we can talk about the geology. It's uh, uh, Muhammad Ibrahim, who's our uh, Egyptologist. He'll teach people the standard what Egyptology teaches to compare what we teach in chemistry. And Yusuf Awiyan, it's the son of of my teacher and his wife, who Patricia Awiyan, who's come to Egypt with me in 2005, has formed the Kemet School of Ancient Mysticism with Yusuf, her husband, in 2009, and she goes very deep into the spirituality and metaphysics, which people really love. And uh, we all come from a different perspective. Brian has a great knowledge of Peru and Bolivia and able to compare the things he sees there with what Egypt is. is now going to be his fifth time coming to Egypt. So he's got it down now. He can see the difference and he can talk about it himself. And we really specialize in teach showing the incredible technology. But we're going to do more this time with the spirituality too. We want people to have that spiritual experience. And everybody does. Just the energy of the sites themselves. You see, they've never been actually shut down. They're still vibrating at that frequency, but you, you know, we, we can teach people. Just your energy. I can feel your energy, for God's <laughs> sakes. You, it's great how passionate you are. Yeah, that's that's one thing I love about Stephen. Oh, I've just, never uh, taken definitely. anybody into the Great Pyramid. To the, what we do in the King's Chamber, who's not been the same after they come out. Everybody. <laughs> I've had people who, I mean, I can give you story after story. Men, who, their wives dragged them to Egypt. One guy will say, I never understood this. You this stuff. I'm not into this. You have the <laughs> mysticism and this blah, 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 the woo-woo. And okay, I said, just go, just come along with us. Experience. After the Great Pyramid, wow, I couldn't believe it. It's like being in an electricity state, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know. Well, <laughs> Everybody gets something. Everybody gets something. But I think you also get a private tour. Don't you get a private tour of the... We get two hours in the Great Pyramid to ourselves. That would be awesome. That is awesome. Oh, that we got. We know. get all chambers oh. open to us, which a lot of groups don't. There's a subterranean chamber, there's a queen's chamber, as well as the king's chamber. So we get it all open to us. That's awesome. Well, Stephen, I hate to even say it's time to say goodbye, but dang it, it's uh, already 15 minutes. But you know, you're always welcome to be on our Thank show. You. And uh, please, uh, it's called Lost Superior Technologies in the Conscious of the uh, Consciousness of the Ancients tour i want i'm seriously one day you're going to be surprised when i get off the plane go and you're like oh 
Tony, <laughs> what are you yeah. doing here? Uh, because I've always wanted to go, and I've heard yep. so many great things about, like you said, the energy, life-changing yep. experience. And uh, and I think if you're if you're into and you're tuned into uh, the 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 consciousness of the pyramids, I think you're going to walk away a, a different person. So. And now is the time to come, unfortunately, because tourism is down. So the lines are not as big. It's not as crazy. Used to be at one time, 20,000 people a day would be on the great on the, King, on the Giza Plateau. 20,000 people a day. Dang. Now, if there's a few hundred, it's great. That's, that's <laughs> wow. sad. All right. Oh, yeah. Stephen Mailer, everybody. Wow. Thank you, sir. And we'll talk to you soon. And uh, keep in touch, all right? All right. See you again. All we'll right. talk soon. You bet. Bye-bye. It's a quick hour, man. I know. When people like this, you can't uh, you can't beat it. He could just go on, and we could. I'd love to hear all about the pyramids and he, him walking through. Twenty one years, he's gone. But when you, I mean, it, I want to hear him when he's on the tour, yeah. like they're pointing out things that you would not even probably think about looking at. Agreed. That's what I saw in that video on YouTube that yeah. he was. Uh, because I, like most you know. people like us, we would go and go, oh, that's amazing. But there's so many details that you don't look at. And he's gone 21 times. I'm sure he's seen stuff. And yeah. It's That's awesome. kind of like watching a movie. You have to watch sometimes a couple times to see everything. Because like, oh, I missed that last time. Right. 21 times, I think you probably don't probably get much. it down. All right. Well, that is it for today. We hope you guys uh, enjoyed our show with Stephen Mailer. Uh, check him out. Go on his tour if you can. Uh, like I said, I'm going to show this one more time. And uh, we'll be back next week right here on Universal Broadcasting Network. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. Subscribe. Leave comments. We'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, listen to us on iTunes Radio, uh, Stitcher, iHeart I uh, Radio, where else? So pretty much anywhere you can find us. Uh, but we uh, hope, and I tell people, and, I've, and we've had some of our guests because of you. If you have a, somebody you want to see on our show, email us. Leave a comment. Let us know that this person would be great for our show. We'll check them out, and we think that it, uh, that we'd like them to have them. We're going to reach out to them and see if we can get them on. So, all right, we'll see you next time right here on Truth Be Told. Bye-bye.